Dr. Francis Cochin is a Wayne Smith Distinguished Professor in Dean Emeritus College of Education, Arbon University in Alabama. She has served as the English as a second language teacher on Guam in the Trust Territory of the Pacific, as a K-12 and university teacher and administrator, and as a university researcher at the Florida State University Research Center. She has authored and edited over 150 publications, including 10 books, and is one of the founding editors of the Mentoring and Mentorship book series for Information Age Press. Dr. Koshan served as the secretary as the chair of the Mentoring and Mentorship Special Interest Group of the American Education Research Association. She also served as the executive board of the International Mentor Association. With that, I want to introduce you to Dr. Koshan. And Dr. Koshan, you have the floor. We are very happy to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's really good to be here. And I thank the association for inviting me to do this. I also want to commend them because this is an area that is totally not totally neglected, but pretty well neglected. And, and your leaders are amazing that they have said, let's do something about this. So I hope that today will be meaningful for you. I thank you for coming. I thank you for having the um, idea of preparing yourself and moving ahead to be a full professor. Because everyone in this room who is not a full professor when you leave today, I want you to be leaving with the notion that you're going to be a full professor and you have the tools, the information, and all you need to do that. So with that, I think we will start. Got a little extra there. <laughs> yes, as, as um, Monica said, the, the title of this is Becoming a Full Professor, Understanding Context, Overcoming Barriers, and Creating Mentoring Relationships. Um, Monica told you about my background, but I want to share a, a couple of extra things with you about that. When I, I was in the K-12 arena for about 20 years, and then I took a position as the superintendent director of a research school at Florida State University. So in that position, I was interacting with university personnel. They were coming to my school, was working with the president, the deans, and all of those people. And I realized at the time, I don't understand this context. I don't understand this culture. And every place we go to, every place we work, every position we're in has its own culture. And part of becoming a full professor successfully is understanding that culture. That's where I became aware of it. And that's where I started my first mentoring relationship after 20 years, it was too long, but that's where I learned about how, what a difference that can make. And it's something we'll talk about today. So here's what we're going to look at. We're gonna take, about 10 minutes to talk about the status of the professorship in the US, just to give you an understanding of that. And then we'll have a, a short breakout where you can talk to each other, meet each other, think about what we've learned so far. Then we're going to look at reasons for becoming a full professor, barriers to promotion, and strategies for achieving promotion to full professor. Then we'll have a second breakout room where you can converse and talk about this and any questions that you might have so your leaders can look at that for the future. And then we'll look at creating mentoring relationships to support promotion. Because one of the most important things you can do in your life and your profession is to engage in mentoring relationships. Then we'll have a breakout room three where you can talk about that. And we'll end with closing remarks. So let's get started. This might be surprising. There's about a little over 130,000 faculty members in the US. 
and the average age is 46. And if you look at male, female, it's quite similar. And the LGBT is uh, about 16% reported. Racial composition, you can see that the majority are white, followed by Asian and Hispanic Latino, Black, African American, mixed race, and unknown. Then we look at the um, schools of planning, and I couldn't put these next to each other because they're reported somewhat differently, but you can see that the, the breakdown is similar, um, 66 rather than 66.1, 10.4 .4 for um, Asian rather than 11. The difference, the only really big difference is that there is um, a lesser amount of um, Hispanic Latino. Uh, in the general population, it was about 11, and here it's six. Here, this is also um, reporting the Native American, which you can see is just a very small percent there, and then other, and then foreign, which was not reported in the first composition. But here's something really interesting. Of all the faculty in the U.S., only 37% are in tenure track positions. So if you're on that position, that's an elite position. And of those, only 10% are tenured right now, 10%. And look at the breakdown of the number that are full-time and part-time contingent, which is something that is happening even more and more in the university today. Maybe that's happening in yours. But I put this here because I want you to really think about this. You know and I know that the power in our departments and in our profession is with the full professors. So you need to be there. You need to be there to assure that our profession is as it should be. You need to be there because what you do is important. So I want you to really look at this and think about this as we proceed. In uh, accredited schools of planning, 57% of faculty are male and 43% female. And when we look at tenure, it's a little bit closer. And apparently from your literature, you've made some real progress in that area. But if you look at the, let's look at the demographics of tenured faculty in accredited schools. And I, and I highlighted that because I wasn't sure exactly how many, what percentage. I wanted to be sure that you were getting accurate information, understanding what you're looking at. So as you can see, the majority of faculty here, as we said, is white. And if you look at tenure figures across the, the spectrum, you can see some differences. Of course, the percentage of faculty is small, but this is what we look like in tenure in schools of planning. I'll give you a minute to look at it. Now, here's another interesting stat. Between 39 and 50% of tenure track faculty members become full professors less than half. Now, it may be different in your institution, but this is overall, again, I go back to the fact that these are the people who make the decisions. These are the people who create our cultures. These are the people who determine what research is important, what research is not. You need to be there. That's why you're here today. But I'm just saying this over and over again, because you do need to be there. If we look at the gender race of full professors in the US, we see some things that are a bit different than what we saw before. We see that the majority are male, and then there's a small amount that is not identified. This is what we see in the full professorships in the US today. So why? Why do we see the gender and ethnic discrepancies in the professorship? This is what the research says. 
females still spend more time with family takes more time out of their work takes more time of course uh taking time out when you have a child which is supposed to be okay and you're supposed to be on um time that you get extra time for that family leave in many places but when it comes time to look at what you've produced sometimes people don't remember that think about build that in but it does take I know I had a a young woman that went through that and um had an a ill husband and when she was ready to go for full professor people hadn't really thought about that so she had some downtime and we'll talk about that a little bit later how you deal with that female minority groups do tend to be younger and you are seeing a movement you are seeing that there are getting to be uh, more people of color more people more women who are moving up and into the professorship so the fact that they're younger does make a difference but here's a really important thing and I'm going to talk about that again later. The research topics that female and minority groups do often are related to their groups, often related to minority issues, often related to people being left out, often related to issues of fairness, all kinds of things like, well, these things are not always as well accepted, not only by the colleagues you're working with, but by journals and some organizations. Obviously, it's not your organization because I've looked at what's come through, what you're doing. But some organizations that might be harder to make presentations on these issues. Here's another one. And if you're in this, if you're a person who assigns people to committees or if you're a person of color or minority or female, service assignments you take on because you care about this you care about these issues in your own places and other places sometimes you get assigned to these things they take a lot of time I'm not saying don't do them but I'm saying be aware of how much time it's taking away from your research and that probably is not going to be considered when you go up to be a full professor it may in some places if you can connect it to your research and you can connect it to your other work, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be aware because perhaps there might be a time when you take a little leave from doing some of that so you can concentrate on getting your research out there. And of course, there are always issues of overt or covert discrimination that occur. So this is what the professorship looks like in the U.S. today. We're going to take a little break. I know it's a quick little air, look, quick little talk here, but we want to give you some time to just absorb it and think of that. Maybe get to know each other. If you don't already have a tablet or a computer or phone or paper, or something that you can write notes on, um, why don't you go ahead and do that at this time? Because we will have two other breaks as we go ahead. So we'll give you a. 15 minute break and we ask you to share these questions to the point that you can you may not get to all of them why have you joined this workshop today I commend you for being here it, it shows a, a real dedication so why did you join and who are you as an academic today where are you are you an associate? Are you assistant? Are you? I see there's some people who are students. Wonderful that you're here today. Maybe you're someone who's already a professor and you're here today to help others or to, to look at how what you can do to make things better. And if you have time, what surprised you or concerns do you have? And if you don't have time to talk about it, you might want to jot that down. Or I know there's a chat room that, not a chat room, but I know you can make comments and you might want to put those in there. So we'll take a break, and I'll see you back in 15 minutes. All right. So I put Ruth in with one of the other groups. 
Um, so we have four groups. You have four groups, each mm -hmm. with five, and then one that has six. Um, but the, so, that one is with Ruth. So, so we only ended up with twenty. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's, That's okay. okay. It's very common. Maybe some other people will join us. That's what happens, I think. It does. Yeah. But I'm glad you recorded it, you're recording it, because it does show you have other people and maybe they'll listen to it. And that's yeah. the, that's oh, the thing. And we'll make sure that um, we email everybody who expressed interest. Oh, that's great. Yes. Um, so they'll have the video link and your bibliography and, you know, your handout. So good. Yep. And some people may join us too. Mm -hmm. You did such a nice job branding this presentation. I love it. Did I? Oh, good. <laughs> very calm and very, uh, I loved it too. It was very oh, good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. It's a wonderful, you know, I've had a wonderful time um, looking into this. And again, I really do commend you because this is such a, this is like a lost thing. People don't help. They don't help you to become a full professor. They don't even think about it. And the literature is, there's not a lot of literature either about it. I had to kind of dig and, and look around. But you have a couple people in, um, I, I came across two really nice articles. They're old, um, but about- Brian, let me, sorry to pause. I'm, I'm gonna let somebody in and oh, just good. welcome him and then pop him into a guest room. So I just wanted to let you know. Wonder. So he's not sitting there for a while. Good. Okay. I right, can one sec. Hey, Chuan, are you there? <laughs> I think he's is muted. That's okay. I popped him into a room anyway, so. I'll figure out what's going on. <laughs> Everything, well. Everything really well. They're in their little breakout room right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge. Okay. Yeah, let's go down there. Oh, there's somebody else coming. Okay. Somebody else joined. Did you see the that note about somebody being late that they're traveling with students? Yes. So yes. The, I think at, at this point there there was a person who told me she could come at one o'clock. So I will to help as a facilitator. So I, I I will say that we don't need, right? Yeah. I don't. Oh, okay. yeah, no, we don't need. Because we, yeah, okay, so. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, because Ruth is here. So if we needed one more, we've got Ruth, yeah. I, I will need her just a sec. So um, how many people are coming to your conference? Oh, we're just above 1100. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> I was really think I was had my fingers crossed for 1200. 1100. Um, that number will grow a little bit cuz we still have 2 oh, weeks. But how many yeah, members 11. How many members do you have? Oh my gosh. Uh we have a thousand about a thousand full-time faculty. Uh-huh. And almost that many what we call part-time faculty or right. affiliated faculty that's what's happening mm -hmm. yeah and then another um 500 or so students oh that's so, and yeah and then we have lots of people who just want our newsletter you know oh, wonderful so you have yeah. all those students that's fantastic mm -hmm. you must be doing some great things to keep students coming I feel like we do. I feel like ACSP um, does everything they can to support their students. Right. Um, and in years past, we've always provided travel scholarships when we can. And oh, so I've got Sylvie coming in right now. And so same thing. If she talks, we'll just welcome her and send her into another okay. room. That's wonderful. That is really wonderful. 
<laughs> wow. Shows you're doing what people want. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's fantastic. Hey, Sy Hi, Sylvie, can you hear us? Um, yeah, it's funny that I am joining and have to go in the broken room. I didn't join the beginning of the session. Sorry. So, okay, we'll have, I'm just going to pop you into a breakout room if that's okay. There's still some time for them, nine more minutes in the breakout room. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. You bet. Hang tight. There she goes. Um, yeah, so getting back to our students, we do a lot at the conference as well to kind of um, especially help those who are on the job market. Um, universities are providing information about jobs and positions they have available and um, they're presenting their research so it puts them in the spotlight so wonderful that is really wonderful and um, <clears throat> I think it's really interesting that you do something for the part-time people you know the people that aren't um, on tenure track because I don't really know of organizations doing that our organization doesn't do that. That's well, it's mostly just keeping them connected. But I mean, that's one. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Just so they can hear everything that's going on. They, they don't get any benefits really, except for the connectivity, you know, but they can come to any of these workshops or things like that, that we do that don't cost any money. So that's, that's fantastic. And do you have a workshop every year? Do you have annual um, meetings every year? So the big conference every oh, year wow. um, and in the past these kind of webinars were really um based on the the kind of energy and initiative of diff uh, particular committees uh-huh um I'm sorry um but i'm hoping kind of as we move forward that we might make webinars more of a practice and maybe even i hate to say this uh revenue producing that's a good idea even um, if it was just nominal twenty five dollars, you know, it's a good idea, actually. Yeah, I have. A, we, we pay have, for all the video editing yeah, and you know all that kind of stuff. stuff. Right. The Mentoring Association has webinars every month. They have a one hour app webinar every month, and they just have different people do it, but they don't charge. But you know what? I think I'm going to tell them about that because yeah, it does cost money. T yeah. And I mean, people are doing the webinars for free, but still. Mm -hmm. And um, it it does, uh, and I've gone to some of them. And you don't get a lot of people, but at least you get some engagement, and then they're there. So, you'd well, have shoot! I mean, how much value would you get out of a workshop where there were ten or fifteen people? Right? That would be exactly. I think, incredible. Yeah, exactly. You'd be able to engage with each other better. Exactly. And and yeah. that's about what that's about what they get, and it works really well. You know, I've enjoyed them. That's not right. We got another five and a half minutes. How many? Five and a half. Boy, that went fast. That went fast. Monica, did you get to have your lunch? Yes, I did. That's good. <laughs> did you? Um, actually, I had I had something before I came. I had like an energy drink. Okay. I thought that would be a good thing to have. <laughs> I usually do that in the morning.
it'll be interesting to know why people came you know what 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 motivated them of course they want to be an associate professor but I was uh, pleasantly surprised by your figures of men and women being tenured. That was a surprise. Um, way ahead of the fields, other fields in general. So that was a surprise. So there's somebody called Powerful Pathways who is sitting in the waiting room. <laughs> Do we know who that is? No. <laughs> All right, well, let's see what happens. Maybe they have a consulting firm or something. Mm. <laughs> hey, wait, put your picture back on. Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in, tra I'm transitioning from one meeting to another. So <laughs> that's why I turned my, my screen off, but glad you're here. Glad, glad to be here. Yeah, good. Well, so everybody's in a breakout room at the moment. They're in there for another mm -hmm. three minutes. So maybe that'll give you time to get where you're going. And then you can, um, uh, everybody else will join us back in this main room. Okay, sure. Apologies for being late. I was actually at a meeting with um, some tough students. Um, <laughs> All right. Planning program. So it's, it's related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, walk, walk safely. And then in two and a half minutes or so, you'll you'll see everybody come back to the room. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So what, one thing that will be good, Fran, is oh. whenever they come back, you can you can say thank you for those who are facilitating and are taking notes in the breakout rooms. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Because in, in some breakout rooms, a person is a facilitator and another is that they are taking notes. Okay. So somebody's taking notes and somebody's facilitating? Yes. Okay. So just say thank you for those volunteering. Happy to do that. Thank you for suggesting that. And then let me just confirm, um, when I set up the next set of breakout rooms, you want me to shake the people up, right? Because then they'll get to talk. To other people or do they need to be the no, same? No, I, I think it should be the same. Yes, I agree. I think it should I think you should leave them together because they form they can form a relationship and they'll be more open. Okay. And then when they go to the conference, they'll get they'll know each other too. So I think that would be nice. It opens That's up fine. I agree with that. Back in 18 seconds. I accidentally 
jettison myself from the breakout room. <laughs> Sorry, my breakout room. I was trying to make that that prompt go away and I made myself go away. <laughs> you abandoned them? <laughs> yeah, very abruptly. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So 17 more seconds and they'll be back. <clears throat> I guess what I said before that it gave them an additional 60 second warning. So. Right, Donna, everybody's back, right, Donna? I believe, well, at least it's telling me they are. Yes, so we can continue. Yeah. Okay, Fran, go ahead. Fran, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Fran. For some reason. Now, now we can hear you. Now you are good. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. I'm sorry. I ran into some kind of little issue here, but I'm good. I'm good. I'm back. And thank you for coming back. And we've got some new people joining us. I want to thank the people who facilitated and served as facilitators. Thanks so much for doing that. And the recorders for taking notes. I hope you had a good conversation. So now let's get into the meat of things. Planning to become a full professor. We're going to look at the realities of that. And first, I'm going to talk to you about why. Why should you become a full professor? Because my goal is that everybody in this room today who is not a full professor leaves with the tools to become a full professor and the desire to become a full professor, because you know what? You need to do it. Remember those figures, the percentages that actually become full professors? And you know, and I know that it's the full professors who make the decisions, who create the environment who create the culture. We need to be one of those. Their personal awards, rewards, of course, accomplishment, self-esteem, more income, more possibilities for sabbaticals, which are just wonderful, and you want to do that in your career. Greater respect and status in the department. But look at the last one, more power to create change in the department. If you're happy with your department, then being a full professor, you can maintain that culture. But if you're not, then you can be the one that helps change it. There's institutional awards, higher status in the department, improved opportunities for professorships, greater possibilities for internal awards, and advanced potential for advancement in the institution if you're thinking that you want to become uh, an administrator of some type. And again, and, you, and, and emphasizing this, power to change the institution. If you like the way the institution is and you're a full professor, you can help maintain it. But if you don't, if you see cha changes that need to be made and you're a full professor, you have a better chance of doing that. And then there's the external awards, superior status in the profession, more visibility for your work. I can tell you that when you become a full professor, People look at your work in a different way. More people come to your presentations. People see your name. They read your things. It is easier to get published because people know you. They know your work. They see your work. They see that you're a full professor. They'll come to you. Awards and titles. And I'm not talking here. I'm not talking here about ego. I'm not talking about me, 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 me. I'm talking about the profession. When you become a full professor, 
and you get some type of wonderful award out there, then that says something about your institution and your department. It brings honor to them. It brings them something special. It, it helps people to see, wow, that must be a great place. Those must good, be good people. They must have uh, an understanding of, of what our work is all about. So, and then there's a course, Enhanced Response Job Opportunities, anywhere you wanna go. Enhanced power to change the profession. If you like what's going on, great then help maintain it. And if you don't, help change it. Again, it's not about ego. It's about being a responsible person in your profession, being the person that helps to frame the future and maintain the present when it's really good and powerful. And here's a really, maybe a challenging quote, a surprising quote, it's not just as difficult to achieve the rank of full professor as it is to achieve the rank of tenured associate professor. It is more difficult. And because it is more difficult, it does require planning, thinking, mentoring, preparation. Again, that's why I commend your leaders for putting this on today because it's so needed. We're gonna look at the barriers first before we come to how you overcome them. Here's some of the barriers that the literature tells us about. One is ageism. And this is very interesting because we're not talking specifically about older people, we're talking about younger people. There, there is a hesitancy to tenure, to promote people who are 40 or under, under 45. And if you've come directly through, you might be under 45 and you might be a superstar, but there's still a reluctance there. The time and rank is, it, it averages five years. There are some institutions that actually tell how many years you must be in rank but the other, most don't. So the average is about seven years. And uh, there's some reluctancy to promote too soon. Again, I mean, I had, I was in a situation when I was an associate, I wasn't an associate, I was an associate professor, so I couldn't vote on this. But we had a young man in our program who was a superstar. I mean, he, he was so well published, he was so well known, he was doing just beautiful work and he's a Wonderful young man, great teacher, just fantastic. And he wanted to go up early, one year, wanted to go up one year early. And the full professor said, no, no, you, you need to wait, kind of wait your turn. No, no, just just wait. You, you, you don't have quite enough, just wait. And so what did he do? He left, he left, but it happens. And sometimes there's discrimination against people if after 10 years or more, if they've been there for a long time and maybe they've had some time when they didn't produce as much, family issues, ill issues, whatever. And they get to be used, people used to get used to seeing them as, as an associate and they are reluctant to even apply. And sometimes when they do apply, people kind of think, well, you know, they're probably not that good. If you have, um, if you if you have been in rank for over ten years, and you had a period or less, and you had a period where maybe you weren't producing as much, there's ways to deal with that. So don't think about that. If that's if you're in that situation, just put that aside because we're going to talk about that today. You go ahead, you apply, you get ready, you prepare because you're going to be a full professor. Gender and race, we did talk about the assigned service responsibilities related to gender and race that sometimes take time from people so that they don't have the time they need to concentrate on their research or their teaching or their service. And as I said earlier, that research focus has less prestige. And your planners of color interest group found that and, and reported that to you. So that is a real thing. 
if they're focused on research that is focused on these issues, sometimes it's more difficult to get published. And also institutional heritage. There are 46 planning programs, 10 are private, two are HBCUs, and 32 are public research institutions. But five universities account for a third of the faculty and accredited programs in your area. Now, I'm not saying anything about these people. They're good people. They're well-trained. All of those things are true. But if you come from those five universities, you tend to have connections. You tend to have already coming in. You know who, what the, who the journals are. People know you because you've gotten connected. You've gotten connected through each other. And there is a bit of an advantage there. There is an advantage there. There's definitely an advantage there. But if you don't come from those, then there's, there's a little barrier for you. You have to do more. You have to do more in terms of getting connected and understanding the culture and understanding how to become a full professor. Timing. As I said earlier, average time and rank is about seven years, and most people receive it in their mid-40s. For people who are in work areas that are applied and they were in the field first and they come, then the ages might be a little later. But here's the reality. If you apply early and you succeed, well, then you become the superstar. But if you apply early and you fail, then sometimes you're looked at as somebody who's arrogant and you might go into the never promoted pool. So you need to think about it. People who apply after many years, maybe 15 years, even more, sometimes they're just discounted because people think of them as they're the associate, they've been there, they're a good teacher, they're this, but they don't, they don't think of them as being promotable. Now, some places people get honored if they stay around for a long time. I was in a situation where we had someone in our department who had been there for probably 40 years and she was well-loved. She was a wonderful teacher. She, she didn't do a lot of research. And in the last three years, somehow they got her promoted to full professor. Doesn't happen often. And you don't want to be there. You don't want to be at the last years to get this. You want to do it now, now, soon. And then there are personal barriers. We talked about family responsibilities, male or female. Sometimes family responsibilities take us away from being able to do the things we want to do in our own research and teaching and service. The gaps in the publications and research, sometimes people will feel like that should hold them back. I had a colleague that felt that way. She had family responsibilities. Her husband was sick. She had periods of time when she didn't publish. She's been there 20 years and she got promoted last year because a lot of us told her, just go ahead and do it. <clears throat> You've got the record now. You can take care of that. So if that's an issue, we'll talk about that again. Don't let that stop you. Some other barriers, not really understanding how to make connections in the field. You have to be connected in the field. You have to be known. You have to learn how to do that. You have to go to conferences and we'll talk about doing that. I'll give you some strategies for doing that, but it's very important. And we'll talk more about that later. Sometimes people take on administrative duties or responsibilities. And when they do that, it's very difficult to continue to, to, to do research, publish, do outstanding teaching, do public service at the level that's needed to become a full professor. I have a, a colleague who's done that recently. He's an associate professor and he's become the chair of the department. I suggested you not do it. It's If you want to become a full professor, it's really difficult to do that and, and keep your publishing and keep everything going. So think twice about doing that. If you do it, do it for a limited time. Um, inadequate planning to become a full professor. You really have to plan for this. It takes time and you have to plan strategically, have to be strategic about doing it. 
And then there's the issue of procrastination or insecurity, feeling that, well, I really haven't done enough. Maybe I'm not ready. In fact, the research shows that women tend to tend to go up to be full professors about 3.5 years later than men. And some of this uh, is related to, to issues of, of, fe of females feeling like they need to take more time or there's, uh, and of course, we go back to the family issues as well. But if you're a procrastinator or you're insecure, you don't, you got to get rid of that. And one of the ways to do that is through mentoring. And we'll talk about that. There are personal relationships and clashes and there are political power dynamics. There are realities for some people. They're hurtful, they're difficult, but they're not impossible to overcome. So we will talk a bit about that as well. You can deal with it. I've heard people say, well, they're never gonna let me become a full professor. I'm gonna tell you something, if you do the work, and I'm gonna say this over and over again, and we'll talk about what the work is. If you do the work, you do the work, even if you have these issues, you can overcome them because there are people above them and if you do the work and you have the record, you can do it. I've seen it done. Now, there are institutional barriers, and these are realities. In most places, there are some places this may not be true. But in most places, these criteria to become a full professor, they change without notice. All of a sudden, it's a different, it's a different thing than it was five years ago. They're very subjective, They've, they're vague, and they tend to be not really transparent. And their team, there's a lack of flexibility in the types of contributions that count. Research tends to count everywhere. When you're looking at public service and teaching, it's a little bit more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult. Language tends to be unclear, and there are loopholes so that those people who maybe don't like you or are look, aren't looking at your record or have problems or issues or whatever, which are not supposed to be part of the decision-making allows them to vote no. And it does make it difficult to prepare or to challenge, but not impossible, not impossible. And then the lack of program understanding in a department. Many of your departments are, many of your programs are in departments like mine was in, where we did, I wasn't in an, a leadership department. I was in a, a department that did primarily research and they were quantitative, primarily quantitative researchers and they didn't really understand what our program and what we were doing. So we had to educate them. And that's something that you may have to do yourselves and make sure they understand what do people in planning do? What is it important in your field? That might not be important in their field. And that's part of preparation. Now that we've talked about the barriers, let's talk about becoming a full professor because that's what this is about today. As I said earlier, my goal is for everyone that walks out of this room who is not a full professor to be starting to prepare tomorrow. And those of you, I noticed uh, there were some of you that are assistant professors. This, I hope, will make you understand that you just keep on going after you get that associate. And those of you that are students, that when you get into the profession, your ultimate goal is to become a full professor. You can do it. It requires planning and, of course, doing the work. When you... When you go for full professor, you focus on one area. So you go, you, you're going to go for either research, teaching, public service outreach, but you are expected to be satisfactory in the others as well. So you need to assure that you're a satisfactory in all but outstanding, at least in this one. So let's look at what the what the research says counts in general. A survey of doctoral and non-doctoral granting institutions found that 6.2%, 6.2% of deans selected teaching as the most important work of the professor. 
think that's quite astonishing. And in doctoral institutions, it was only 1.6%. So if you're going to go up in the area of teaching, you really need to prepare and know what you're doing and get, get things together. And I understand that you're going to have a session at your conference that people are going to share who have gone for, up for teaching and, and for research and for public service. So go to that because that's wonderful. Again, don't, don't let this discourage you. Just be aware and understand so you can plan. Now, at smaller private non-doctoral institutions, teaching and public research may be more important than indicated here. And public service and outreach may be more valued in land-grant institutions if you're in one of those. Again, research tends to be highly valued everywhere. Teaching and service and outreach varies. So let's get started. You've got to learn what counts in your institution. Read and study the guidelines. Start now. Talk to others who've been promoted inside and outside of your institution to find out what they did, how they did it, what barriers they ran into, and find out about these unwritten rules that are floating around because there are unwritten rules. There are some things like we talked about, well, don't go early. That might be an unwritten rule. Um, whatever it is, they're there. Now, this one is really important. Examine the dossiers of those in your area who have been promoted in the last five years. Look at what they've done. Take notes. Now, this can help you if, if by some chance you do not get promoted because you will have the information you need to challenge that. But also more importantly, because you are going to get promoted, more importantly, it gives you some guidelines. It shows you what you're going to have to do. If there haven't been that many promotions in your institution, you might look at similar programs in your institution or similar institutions outside. But be aware, requirements change and you may have to do more than others. I had that experience at my institution. Again, if you go back to what I talked about earlier, things change. Just be aware, be knowledgeable, be knowledgeable and be prepared. That's how you get prepared, by gaining knowledge. You develop a plan for success. Create a timeline. When do you want to be ready to be promoted? And develop a plan of action. Within that plan of action, you want to decide whether you're going to go for teaching, research, public service, or outreach. Then you create strategies and procedures to connect research. If you're going to go for teaching and public service, you want to connect research to it. So if you if you if you're in, pub, in looking at public service or outreach that you've done, you want to have published on it. You want to have demonstrated that other people are using your work. You want to show that you have a national or international presence and that people know what you're doing. If you choose one of those areas, you might you publish on it. You might do books on it. You make sure that information, that it's your research, what people call research is connected to your public service and your teaching. And we're going to go into that in more detail in a moment. So here are some sample research outcomes. I haven't, got, I don't have everything here, but these are some things that count. And again, what counts at your institution? What are they looking for? What have other people done? When you go for research, you're expected to have extensive publications and they may, it, it depends on your institution. Particular journals hold more weight than others. You wanna look at the impact statistics of your work, but find out what counts, what counts, what counts. Do you have to be in a particular journal in, in your institution or, or is it more open than that? Books, authoring books. Some places you must have a book, one, two books. Some places they look at books and say, well, we're not that interested. 
book chapters the same way. What counts? It doesn't matter what counts at somebody else's place. What counts on your place? Sitting on editorial boards. You have to be connected. You have to be known. Try to get on editorial boards. Um, talk, talk to people who are editors. When you go to conferences, talk to these people. Learn about what they're... I, I had someone tell me when I first started out, call some journals that you are interested in and ask them what they're missing. What, I, what would they like to publish on? And if it's in any way related to what you're doing, then work on that. Holding offices in national and international associations is essential for all three of these things. Receiving national or international grants is important. Being invited to be speakers at presentations and, of course, research awards and honors. This isn't everything, but it gives you some idea of the kinds of things that are usually expected if you're going to go up in the research area. If you're going to go up in teaching, it's not just about teaching well where you are. This is national or international, remember. So, of course, you'd have to have outstanding institutional assessments. But what you do in teaching is going to have to have internal and external impact beyond your own environment. Teaching related to campus and professional mission statement, they're probably going to look at that. I mean, is it related to what we care about in the teaching area and the professional mission of your groups, your own associations? Teaching awards, internal, but particularly external. Inclusivity in relation to, to students. What are you doing with your students there? And are you doing anything about that in, in, in the kind of research you're talking about or the teaching you're talking about? Is that present? And do you have innovative strategies for fostering student success? You have imaginative and innovative instructional techniques or approach. It's not just about being a good teacher. It's about changing something about the way teaching is done. And not just where you are, but nationally, internationally. Are you have publications and contributions about innovations in teaching learning at the national and international levels? And of course, holding offices on boards. When I've come to planning and service, I've broken this up a little bit because I know that in your area, this is something that is, is looked at and done and used more often. And it's, so I, I want you to think about this, if you're going to go this way, that there's a lot already done about this. People have done this and, and there's research in your own literature. These are older, articles from Checkaway and Loveridge, but they're really good. And they talk about public service and what it means and how you go about uh, going up for public service, using public service in your area. I also, I have a, a bibliography of references that I put together for you that will be on the website for those of you who complete this workshop. And it includes these two, it's, it's eclectic, it has different kinds of readings in there, some focused more on just how you go about becoming a full professor, how you put your how you put things together. And I hope it will be helpful to you. But planning faculty often participate in public service as a primary focus, and the faculty in your department may not understand this. So you've got to educate them, you've got to let them know what this is, what you're doing, particularly your department head and gain that support of your department head. Then assure that your practice is connected to your research and that you're publishing your work. It's gotta be out there published, it's gotta be known and connect with others who have used this successfully. We'll talk about that in mentoring, but that is really important. Learn from others. And here are some of the things you'll need for public service or applied scholarship. National or international impact or prestige. People know your work. They're using your work. They're replicating your work. Grants or other types of publishing. 
impact, what is the impact on individuals or communities? What does the public service, what difference has it made? Have you made, have you written about it? Have you made presentations about it, particularly at national and international levels? Have you had invitations from others to share or to duplicate? Are others doing what you started? Is it happening in other places? Do you have any public recognition for the work that you've done? And of course, offices and national and boards and sitting on editorial boards. So these are the common things that go into being promoted in these areas. Then there's you. It's really important to maximize your power and your prestige. And I'm saying this to you, I want to emphasize, as I did earlier, you're not doing this for yourself. You're not doing this for your ego. You're doing this for the profession. You're doing this for those that follow you. You're doing this for the people out there who can read your work, use your work, and it can make a difference in their lives. It can make a difference in the profession. Everyone here who is not a full professor needs to become one, not for themselves, but for the profession. So develop a plan to meet people in your professional associations. When I was starting out, remember I told you I came from the field and after 20 years in the field, then I went into higher ed. I started out at the research school where I was still in the K-12 environment. And I had a young woman come to me to ask me to be her mentor. And um, after she did that, I thought to myself, I've gone through 20 years of my profession and I have never had a mentor. I need to get one. And I did. And I had one for the rest of my professional life. And I'll tell you about that as we go on. But one of the things one of my mentors told me was, when you go to professional associations, plan to meet the people there who are doing the work that you're doing, people whose work you admire. We're not talking about using people. We're talking about learning. And she said, go to, the, go to their workshops or go to their, their um, presentations, ask questions and go up to meet them later. You might even ask them to be your mentor. You'd be amazed at how many of people that, that maybe you look at as the gods of your, your area or the people who are so far above everyone and know so much and have published. You'd be surprised if many of those people are willing to give a helping hand. Volunteer to assist at professional associations and meetings and board and, and be on committees. The way I actually ended up getting connected in, in my profession, coming from the field and not knowing anybody, I went to a, a, one of our national meetings and they asked for volunteers to assist on this work, research project. And so I volunteered. And when I volunteered, I ended up somehow becoming head of it. And that led to all kinds of things. And in years later, I became president of that association. It was, it was just learning from others, connecting with others, doing for others and with others. Seek offices and professional associations. You're going to be expected to show that you're a leader in your field, not just in your university. Volunteer for review, review for the top journals in your field. Volunteer to do that. Here's where you learn what's going on out there. Here's where you learn what other people are writing. Here's where you learn how to write well when you spend, you see when people are not writing well. You might, someone told me one time, and I actually did it, to call the journals that you would like to publish in and ask them what they're what they're looking at what would they like to publish what are they not getting manuscripts about and if it's in any way connected to what you're doing then start writing on that for them and you might get published you might include other prominent people in your work sometimes there are people out there that are doing the work you're doing and you might call them and say i'm working on this would you be interested in working with me 
You never know. Seek mentors of national prominence. Um, I'm working on a project with some people, retired people, and we just decided that there's people in our field that aren't getting mentoring. So we reached out to all kinds of people and people who are nationally prominent who are retired now, some retired, some still working, and asked them if they would mentor. And they all said yes, every one of them. So don't be afraid to ask people who you admire to be your mentor. Offer to speak and provide expertise at other universities. You might be doing something that a friend of yours would be interested in at another university. Go there, present, present your work, and get known. Create networks of colleagues within the profession. When you go to the meeting next month or when you're going to your professional meeting, start, just start talking to people. And there are people there that are doing work like you make some networks. Nowadays, it's so simple. It was much more difficult in my day, but now it's so easy with the internet and Zoom and everything else you've got going. As you're thinking, doing, connecting, start creating a list of possible reviewers. When you go up to become a full professor, they're going to ask you to get them a list of reviewers. You want to be able to get them people who know you and who know your work. So start thinking about that. Start creating a list so that when you're going forward, you'll have people that you can count on who know your work and understand it. So when they do a review, the review is going to be a review that is fair and honest and knowledgeable. Now, there are going to be personal and personality issues. There are people who are your supporters. So engage them, get their advice, maintain their support. If there are difficulties and problems, talk to them. Don't be hesitant to do that. There are people everywhere always who are willing to help, who want you to be a full professor. Work with them. I'm not talking about using them. I'm talking about working with them. There are people who are neutral, so you want to try to gain their support. Let them know what you're doing. Keep them informed. Try to work with them in, in different ways. Maybe you can connect them to some of what you're doing. Not, not in a fake way, in a real way. And then blockers, people that you know are going to block you or may block you. See if you can gain their support or neutralize them. Talk to your supporters about them. Maybe some of them you, you won't be able to. But some of them, if they see that you're really working hard, if they see the work you're doing and they see um, that you're getting awards and they see that things are going well for you and you're real producing, sometimes you can change them. Sometimes you can get them to, to be on your side. So we've talked a lot here, and, and here's something that you need to think about and look at. And do this on a regular basis. Conduct self-analysis. Have you been consistent over time? If you haven't been, all you do, this doesn't stop you. You just provide a rationale for the issue and you go on. For example, I have a friend, she's been there 20 some years as an associate professor. She had a period of time when she could not really do a lot. She did enough, but she didn't do the kinds of things that needed to be done to become a nationally known person early, early in time. She had children, she has an ill husband, lots of reasons. And so she was one of those people that was reluctant to go forward. And we talked with her about this because she has done wonderful work. She is nationally known. So you just put a rationale for what happened and you go ahead. And she did it and she was promoted. Look at the impact statistics of your work in your field. And if you're lacking there, look at what you need to do to, to change that. And here's something just really important. That's why I put it in bold. What is your unique contribution? That's why you get promoted. 
because what you have done is unique in the field. You need to make a case for that. And what others can help you to do that, particularly mentors, make sure that's a priority as you pr prepare your portfolio and as you continue your work and as you prepare. And, and lastly, what is the impact your work has made on the field? You have to be able to tell that story. How has it made a difference in the field, whether it is research, teaching, or public service and outreach? Okay, develop a plan for success. This is just repeating, but it's kind of a summary of what I've said. What is your area of focus? What areas of strength will you show people? Will you highlight? Where are you deficient or weak? Where are you, do you not have a, enough um, people out there who know about you? Have you not connected to the broader um, network? Do you have some weaknesses in the publishing area? Is there a journal that you have to be in in your department to get promoted and you're not in there? What will you do? How are you going to overcome any deficient or weak areas? And I'm going to say this over and over again. Don't be discouraged by any areas. Just work on them. Do the work. You can overcome it. There are people that can help you. Do the work. Whatever potential barriers are there, you develop strategies to overcome those barriers, whether they're personal, whether they're professional, whether there's something about what you've done or not done, or whether it's yourself. If you're a procrastinator, then figure out a way to deal with that. But don't let that become something that stops you. Don't let anything stop you. There should be nothing that stops you. If you are already an associate professor, you, you've proven yourself. You've done everything. You, you, you can do this. If you're an assistant professor, make that your goal. Take one step at a time and make that your goal. And if you're a graduate student, just have in your head that your ultimate goal is you're going to be a full professor so that you can impact the field not only with your work, but with yourself, with your ideas, with your gifts. The field needs you. Remember that 39 to 50%? That's not good. Okay. We're ready for breakout room two. I hope I've given you enough to uh, think about and talk about. We have built in a five minute break after this, but we're gonna ask you to come back and, and think about whether you need the break. If you need the break, you can take the break. If you don't, you can just, Stay with us. So here's some, or you can continue in your breakout room. So what is your greatest concern about promotion to full professor? I've given you some things that can serve as barriers. I've given you ideas about what you have to do and what counts. So what is concerning you about being promoted to full professor? And is there something else you'd like to know or something more you'd like to know? And be very um, open about that because, as I said earlier, this organization, this is just a wonderful thing they've done here. They care about you. They want you to become a full professor. And so if there's something that you want to know that I have not talked about, put that down that will go into the pool of ideas that they'll work from in the future. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you in a little, in about 20, 25 minutes. We, we are going to do only 15 minutes because otherwise it will be, uh, we will not have enough time to talk about mentoring. We have to change. We okay. only have five minutes left. So let's do a breakout room of 15 minutes and then we come back and you talk about mentoring. Thank you. Okay, that'll be good.
So I was looking at it and it looks like we have about, don't we have uh, at least another hour left? You're muted. You're muted. It started at noon and it's already 120. Oh, we're going to just till two. Wow. Okay. And we didn't start to talk about the main topic, which well, is made. We'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. I, I've got it. We'll get through it. It's not going to take that much time. They may not have, they may not have the 20 minute for sharing then after the mentoring one. It's okay. There's less people in each. In yeah, each there's group, less so. people. People left. People yeah. left. Yeah. yeah. We'll have time. Okay. And, um, the going through the mentoring thing probably take 10 or 15 minutes so we'll be good we'll be good i'll be back soon i thought okay okay i guess i miss i missed the time i had put in here 52 that we have 52 minutes left didn't we have two full hours well maybe when you put the time down we had 52 <laughs> um okay so, I mean, it's 2.19. Well, you and I are on Eastern time, right? Right. So it goes until 3 o'clock, and it's 2.19 right now. So we still have another 45 minutes. Yeah, we're okay. They might not get the full, because I'm only going to take about 10 minutes with mentoring. Mm -hmm. So we'll be okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I hope they at least got something that they feel they can use. Well, I saw some nice comments in the okay. um, in the chat room when the the a couple of people had to leave, but they said thank you so much for this important session. Okay, you know, nice comments like that. Looking forward to watching the video. Well, maybe we shouldn't have told them about the video till the end because <laughs> <laughs> now they well, figure they can just come back and do it. Yeah, we didn't have a wave of them; just a couple. So. Okay. <laughs> Good. They'll, I can do I can do the full mentoring. They'll have it. Plus, they have the worksheet on mentoring that they can do later. So will the people that didn't sign up, will they have access to the video too or not? Mm -hmm. Uh that might cause some people to not come, you think? Well, they didn't know that we were recording. Oh, they didn't know that. Okay. Well, I'm glad they'll have access to it. Monica, I can do the, the the mentoring thing. They may not get a full 20 minute break, but I've the mentoring, I've got it. It'll go, it'll go quickly. And I've also got that worksheet that they can work through to do it on their own. So it'll be fine. So when is the conference? October 19th is the opening day of the conference. And we have a board meeting the day before on the 18th. It's so one I'm, taking, I'm taking my daughter. She's 16 years old. 
Oh, Last year, I, after I took my 18-year-old and she worked as a volunteer for the conference, yeah. and then my 16-year-old was going to do the same this year. And well, wouldn't I'm... you know, you know, the bean, the, the um, statue in Millennium Park that's so famous is closed for construction. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that's so awful. Yeah, but she's excited. She remembers going when she was like five years old and we uh -huh. took her to the American Girl doll store. Oh, wow. So I told her to, you know, go into her closet and find the dolls and we'll, she was, <laughs> we're going to go back and have a tea party. <laughs> oh, oh, how fun. What fun. So that'll be fun. Yes, that's lovely. That's wonderful. So they still have eight and a half minutes. Okay. It'd be interesting to know what their greatest concerns are. Will they will they turn these into you? We have access to the same link where they're putting in all the information. Oh, that's wonderful. You know what we could do if you want to um, yes I'm thinking of maybe having the breakout be the end instead of having a break in between this like doing the mentoring thing and then doing the final thing and then letting them break I don't know we'll see I, I, I don't I don't think there is a need to have a five minute break because we don't have time I agree yeah I so think why don't you talk about mentoring and then we we, we they will have a, a another breakout room and right. then you, you do your final report re right reports. right and I think um this this is probably going to take about 10 minutes this mentoring um I think I timed it 10 or 12 minutes then Maybe they can have a 15 minute and the ending is only going to be a few minutes. So we'll be able to do everything. 
And then they have this, I'll tell them also, they have this um, so that they can work individually. They'll have all this information about mentoring. Aside from this, they'll have that sheet that guides them through it so that they can do it, sit down and just think it through um, and, and prepare themselves for a mentor. So they'll have the resources they need. And have made it as succinct so they'll be able to do it on their own. Whoever went up got promoted through teaching. That was brave because that is so hard to do. That's the hardest. Three and a half minutes. Okay. It will be interesting to know how many people access this um, video because that'll give you a sense of, well, you already have a sense of interest. Mm -hmm. be interesting to see how many people access it over time. I yeah. hope they do. I hope they do. Mm -hmm. it's so important. We have a follow-up session at the conference, right, Monica? So you can also yeah. let people know that the video is available because it it should be by that time. All right, so I'm seeing 55 seconds, 54, 53, 50, but um, I think then it gives them an additional 30 seconds before it brings them all back, kind of gives them a warning. And as soon as you see 
<clears throat> more people starting to pop into the room than everybody is here. They bring them oh, all okay. at the same time. So you don't have to wait for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. All breakout rooms will close in 10 seconds. Yes. So now, now they are back. Mm -hmm. They are all back, Fran. Welcome back. I hope you had a good conversation. I've given you a lot to think about in terms of preparing to become a full professor. But this may be the most important thing I'm going to talk about. And that is mentoring, which is a path to both personal and professional success. All the research demonstrates that career and life success is strongly and positively impacted by having mentoring relationships. And your career should be marked with them that they focus on skill and personal development and professional development. I can tell you, I went through half of my career without mentors and half of my career with mentors. And it was an unbelievable difference. As I told you, the first time I actually got a mentor was when I was at the research school and I had a young woman come in and ask me to mentor her. And then I thought to myself, I've never had a mentor. I need one too. So I got a mentor to help me to work in that environment. When I got to Auburn University, come from the field, then I'm working in the higher ed and I realized it was a totally different environment. Every environment is different. And you have to learn it and understand it and come to know how to work within it. So I got somebody internally to help me. And I got somebody externally to help me with publishing because I knew I didn't know what I was doing. Maybe you all knew what you were doing, but I didn't. And I needed someone to help me to, to do that. And then I was very successful in it because I had someone that showed me the way. That's why these connections are so important. And mentoring is so important. When I got to be a dean, I asked who's the best dean. And I asked many people and I got the same person over and over. And I asked him to be my mentor. And it made all the difference in the world. And it will make the difference to you. When you leave here today, tomorrow morning, you start thinking about who your mentor is going to be. And I hope by next week, you'll have done something about it. And this is what you do. First of all, you decide why you want a mentor. Is it for your personal, intellectual, professional growth? Is it for a skill? Is it because you want to do a better job in research? Is it how to prepare your portfolio? It all depends where you are. Is it a specific support to deal with a difficult issue, difficult person, difficult, you're not sure what to do with something? Is it just your general and professional development? Or is it understanding how to deal with the culture you're in? Or is it something else? Now, all of this that I'm giving to you is going to be on your website, so you will have it and use it as a guide. Download it and use it. It will help you. I've worked with many people over the years, and I know that this will help. Secondly, what are the important relational issues? What kind of personalities do you like to work with? Does gender matter? What about ethnicity? What about culture, religious heritage? Do you want somebody, I'm in a program right now that some of the retired faculty started where we're matching um, retired faculty with uh, assistant professors because the field isn't doing a good job like you're doing. And you would be uh, amazed at the, at the people that are willing to do it. So don't be afraid to ask people. And many of the people there are saying they want, uh, for, for example, many of the women are saying they want a woman who's raising children so that, and, and they want to talk to them as a mentor. So what's important to you? There might be something I didn't put up here, but think about that. What's important? What kind of person? And what is practical? Do you want somebody inside your institution or you want somebody outside of your institution? As I told you, I had someone inside for one thing and someone outside for another. Do you want a friend or a family acquaintance or somebody with no relationship? Is it important to you to have someone you already know? And do you want to have face-to-face -face or a distant relationship? 
Is there anything else you want to think about? Nowadays with Zoom, you can ask anybody around the world. So you might want to think about asking someone, one, you know, someone who's doing the best work in the world. You would again, you would be amazed at how willing some of these people that we think of as giants in our field are, how willing they are to mentor people if they're asked. How do you get started? Okay, you you pry it towards the fo focus area. And I'd say um, right now, start with one mentor, but that doesn't mean you have to have only one all the time. Think about, about, about maybe up to three people that you want to consider. And if you don't have anybody in mind, then determine what steps you're going to take to find somebody. You can ask other people. You can search the literature. As I said, who's your hero or heroine? Call them. You don't know they might email them. You don't know that they might say yes. And check with your association. You're going to a conference shortly. There might be people there. Ask somebody, prepare, set up a time to meet with someone that you think you'd like to mentor you. Then you give an invitation. You introduce yourself. And if you know them, you explain your primary reason. If you don't, you share why you selected them. Why did you... Tell them why you, you want them, because that might make a difference in them saying yes or no. Discuss the timeline for the relationship. Now, I usually suggest about six months, and that might sound silly because it isn't enough time to really develop a relationship and get done what you want to do. The reason I suggest that is if you start with six months and it works really well, you just ask, can we extend this relationship? And if it doesn't work well, you can end it graciously and not be upset or upset the other person. Ask if they need time to think about it and when you need to meet and talk again. And if they accept, then establish the next meeting and the time and the place. And if they decline, then just thank them and move on. Okay? So once you've invited somebody and they've said yes, you set up your initial meeting. You send the mentor the discussion topics at least one week prior to the meeting. It's your job to make this efficient and for the person. At the first meeting, you talk about the parameters. How much time are you going to meet? I used to always say an hour. And, and then, or if they don't care, they, they're willing to be flexible. Okay. Tell them you'll be responsible for setting up the meeting and the agenda. And then see if they want to establish any guidelines, like don't call after a certain time, don't text me, whatever it might be. They're doing something special for you, so you want to make sure that the way this relationship is set up is convenient for them. So you're creating this relationship, you listen, and you try to make it as easy as possible for your mentor. Then you have your working relationship. When I was a dean and I had my, my dean, um, and no one ever knew, no one ever knew that he was my mentor. No one ever knew that. They didn't need to know that it was between him and me. I would send him the agenda. I'd tell him, and then when we met, I would give him specific examples, share stories so that the mentor can really understand what the issue is or what it is you're dealing with or what you're struggling with. Uh, if it's publishing, then you share something that you're struggling with there. If it's teaching, you deal with that. But you deal with specific examples so that they can really help you. And then you might want to practice a skill. If you're having difficulty getting along with someone, you might want to practice a conversation. Or if you're making a presentation, you might want to practice that. Share your concerns openly and, and, and trust this person. And then you're responsible for the timing of the next meeting and setting the meeting day. You are responsible for making this smooth and workable. And then you have the long-term status. So at the end of the six months or year, whatever you decide to do, you might extend the relationship. I've done that sometimes. Other times I've gotten what I needed and I, I would go on to another mentor. Or you end the relationship 
and show appreciation. So either you extend it, you keep going, you end it, you show some kind of appreciation, and then you maybe see that person once in a while, or you change the relationship. So now maybe you become colleagues, you start working together, you start publishing together, you start doing public service together. You keep your relationship going, but it's different. I had an experience with that with a, a young man um, who was an African-American who came to our college when I was a dean and I became his mentor. And he was just a wonderful young man, but he was in a different environment he'd been in and, and he, he wanted to have a mentor. I mentored him through his schooling, he became his major professor. And we're at the point now where he's bringing things to me. He's the lead author. He's the leader. I'm le learning things from him. I use some of his work in this presentation. So the relationship's changed. He's actually become a mentor to me in many ways. And that's a beautiful thing when it happens. So I want you to really think about this. Incorporate mentoring into your life. I've given you a strategy. It's very simple, but if you use it, you continue to have a mentor, but also be a mentor. Wherever you are in your career right now, you should be able to mentor someone else. Mentoring should be just continual part of life. Have a mentor, be a mentor. I've given you the strategies to do that. Done it quickly, but it's very comprehensive. And you also have this, as I said, on your website. So you can go through the process. When you leave here tomorrow morning, start thinking about who your mentor is going to be and what the purpose is. We were supposed to have 20 minutes of sharing. Are we going to have some sharing? I have a suggestion oh. because we only have 15 minutes left. Okay. And maybe the participants want, want to ask questions. Let's okay. See. Let's so, see. Okay. Let's try, let's try to switch a little bit to be more interactive with you. Shall so I? Does anyone have questions for the friend? For friend? No questions? Caitlin does. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question related to external reviewers, and this came up in our right. breakout discussion. Okay. Um, we have been told, or at least my chair has um, stated that they are the most important aspect of um, our review for going up for full. And right. so I'd love some thoughts on your part in trying to determine who should be your external reviewer. You've talked a little bit about that, but right. strategies to right. secure, and, and it turns out, at least in my institution, um, they would like to see external reviewers from peer level or right. above institutions, yes. and we are in R1, but they are looking for big names. They want right. Berkeley, Harvard, you know, right. MIT. Those five, yeah, those, those five schools that everybody. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We should so, all, everybody ought to read that Lee article. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, well, I think part of it, part of what I talked about earlier, um, you know, I, some one of my mentors told me this, and I did I didn't share it because I was trying to cut time, but she said that if you have, you know, a shining star, somebody that you, whose work you really use, or somebody like that that you really would like to have um be your reviewer, when you go to the next conference you go to, go to their conference, sit in or go to their session, sit in on it, ask some questions, go up and talk to them. See if you might even be, you know, sometimes these superstars, sometimes they're they're not open, but sometimes they're very open. They might be willing to have lunch with you or might be able to um, be willing to look at your work, but let them know um, who you are and what you're doing. If you're working in the same field, um, that's one way to try to kind of get connected to them. Um, another way to do that is... Um, cite their work and let them know you cited their work and people you know people then they might look at your work so you can possibly send them the work or you can tell them about that but if you cite people and then that goes that go 
that goes in all that stuff and people know that they're getting cited so they'll they all might know your work um if they're if they're working on committees and you might serve on some committees with them to try to get to know them i had a friend that did i never had i never did this i i don't think I was bold enough, but she used to at every every time she went to any kind of conference, she would have a schedule of people like that that she wanted to talk to and meet. And she would reach out to them. She'd go to their session. She'd see if they would have 20 minutes or she'd take them out to lunch. So, you know, there are ways to try to connect with people, um, especially if you're especially if you're kind of working in the same field. That might be one way to do it. Um, if you know someone that knows them, you might be able to get introduced to them. Um, I think using their work is is important and letting them know that you use their work. Um, those are probably on top of my head. If I think of any other things, I could send them um, to the association and have them put that on that web, website. Is that helpful or do... Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, oh, good. All right, good. Oh, another thing you might do is like if you're going to do a session like a roundtable or something, you might invite them to participate in it. If, you know? That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Think of things like that, like how can you include or try to be on some committees they're on or something like that, or include them in them, ask them, ask them to come and speak at, at, your, at your university, ask them to speak at a session you're giving, you know, ask them to highlight things like that. Just think about how you can make those kind of connections. So, you know, we only have 10 minutes and I don't think it's going to be practical to go to another breakout room. Uh, or do you think it's a good idea, you guys, the participants, or may, maybe one thing that I would like to ask I, you, we are going to send you a post-workshop evaluation, and one question that we wanted to uh, answer is how can the ACSP mentoring com faculty mentoring committee help you? Because our goal today was to open this discussion but we really want to know how we can help you as the ACSP faculty mentoring committee. And Ruth wants to say something. So I did, we had one question in our group that I think is probably worth asking. Okay. And, um, um, and that was that in, is the question of administration when you're an associate professor? You didn't mention it, and we interpreted that as saying it was probably less important, but especially things like department chair or other administrative positions in a department. You mean becoming? I, I did talk yes. a little bit. I don't think it's a good idea to do it um, because when you do that, you're not going to really have time to work towards becoming a full professor. Is that what they're asking? Should they do it? Are they asking, can they use that for promotion? I think a little bit of both. Okay. So. All right. Well, my advice is don't do it because um, you get, first you get into political issues so that when you're going to go forward, it makes it a little difficult. And secondly, it uses up your time and it's extremely difficult to keep going and, and um, producing when you're administrator. It's not impossible. I mean, when I was the dean, I kept publishing because I like doing it. So you can do it. But if I were advising you, I would advise you not to do that. I, I don't think it's a good thing. Um, they ask you to do it and then they commend you for doing it. But then when you go forward for full promotion, I've not seen that they give you credit for it. Now, maybe others have. Um, it's very difficult. If you're going to do it, if there's any way that you can work it into your research, is there any way you can work it into your research where maybe you uh, do some publishing on, um, on that role? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think how it could fit into planning. Um, but if there's any way that you can use anything you've learned um, and maybe write on it, 
or use anything you've learned and present on it and somehow connect it, especially if you're going to go up for research, somehow connect it to your research or connect it to um, service. Maybe, maybe there's a way to connect it to service and to write about that. Maybe writing about um, be, being an administrator and trying to become a full professor and the struggles and things you've learned, if you actually can do it. Um, maybe that would be uh, something to help about. But honestly, I would suggest you think about stepping down and not doing that. If there's no other way to do it, um, then you have to do some workarounds and you have to plan your schedule so you continue to publish. Um, one way to do that is maybe to connect with people in the field that are publishing in your area so that you're not the one doing it alone. Um, and, and, you know, do more things that are in, in connection with, with one another. But it's a difficult thing to do. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. I have a, a couple of slides I'll, I'd like to go through before we finish and then come back if we have time to talk. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I, I said earlier, becoming a full professor is about doing the work. And, and I, I wanna emphasize that again, doing the work. And what is the work? You determine the focus. Is it teaching? Is it research? Is it public service or outreach? Now you have to do good work in all areas. Remember, you have to do good work in all areas. You build an impressive body of work. Impressive. It's got to be strong. And you continually conduct an analysis of strengths and areas that need work. This is a summary, but I want you, I just want you to think about this. You gain knowledge. What are the requirements? What's the context and culture you're in and how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to deal with the barriers there? How are you going to deal with the people that aren't going to support you? Know what your rights are. If you are in a situation that's toxic where you're doing the work and you cannot overcome it, do the work, prepare, the, prepare it, go forward, if you don't get promoted internally, go forward. I've seen that as a dean, I've had to do that sometimes. Sometimes I've had to go against what the faculty said because I could see that it was personal. If you do the work, you do the work. Look at what things are facilitating you to succeed and what are your personal barriers and what are the contextual barriers and make a plan to overcome them. That's the work. Do the work. Okay, that's it. Do the work. All right, any other questions? Thank you so much for this. Yes, any other questions? Thank you, yes. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to do this. It was, a, it was a joy to do this. It's such important work. And I just cannot, again, thank you enough for doing this for your association. It's a wonderful gift and you should be commended for it. I hope people will use it. I hope they'll, I hope they'll look at the recording. I hope those of you that were here got something of value from it. And I hope every single, I, I am expecting every single person here to be a full professor within the years ahead. Thank you. Thank many you. expressions of thanks in the comments, Fran. Yes. Thank you. And we also want to thank you the ones who were in the breakout rooms and making notes. Thank you again for, and for facilitating the discussions in the breakout rooms. And thank you so much for coming today. All of you. Thank you, Manika. Just as a general announcement, there will be a follow-up session at the ACSB conference. I believe it is on Friday morning. I don't, I don't have that schedule in front of me, but it is what we have put in that session 
is five faculty um, who have used slightly different emphasis in their career to get promoted to full. They're all full professors. There's an administ There's one that did did take on administrative role. There's the Uber researcher. There's someone who's very strong in um, outreach. Uh, outreach, and so it's really a, a, ni a nice mix of people. So I would encourage you to look for that session. It is sponsored by the mentoring committee. It's very interesting that you actually have someone that went forward administration. I've never known anyone be able to do that. That's amazing. Well, <laughs> that's amazing. It's wonderful. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> good, good for that person. Breaking, yeah. breaking ground. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.